Yep. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Um, so LinkedIn, Dropbox, MySpace, all of these big companies share one thing, interesting thing, that is they've all suffered from data breaches. They've all lost their customer password hashes, lost passwords. What does it say to us? Well, uh, it does say to us that if such big companies had problems with, uh, with that, maybe it's not the easiest thing to uh, to like we should be prepared for the situation that we can lost our customer passwords and we can do whatever we should do whatever we can best possibly best things we we should possibly do to uh, protect it so what what should we do um i will introduce you to the concept of slow hashing algorithms and uh then i will also uh, tell you a story, a case study of a successful password hash migration that we did in our systems, in our system. So, without further ado, let's uh, begin. Uh, one question, how many of you have heard anything about slow hashing algorithms? Okay, <laughs> not a lot of you. So, um, that's good, that's actually good. Uh, my name is Tomasz Borowiec and I will not play the piano. Um, I'm a senior software engineer and at Akado. Uh, they just looked at me, they said, you look old, so you're a senior now. Okay, uh, basically that's the agenda. I already uh, told you what it will be all about. First, uh, first part is mostly theoretical about slow hashing algorithms. Next part is a case study. Then some summary, some links. Okay, so hashing algorithms. I think that uh, Every single one of you have used something like this, like MD5, for example, right? You have an input, you have the Eagle Flies at Midnight input so string, and you run through, run it through MD5, and you get a one-way hash. It's a one-way hash. There is no possibility to uh, do the the process backwards. So the only thing, the only way to get to to know whether this hash is correct whether the hash, this hash is uh, actually the eagle flies at midnight, is to run the MD5 again and compare the results. So that's a familiar concept, right? So hashing algorithms basically are divided to two groups. First one is these fast, old school, and general pur purpose hash algorithms, like MD5, SHA-1, and so on. And they are basically not really designed for strings, they're for binary data, and they're really cool for, like, example, validating your download. But there are also slow hashing algorithms, uh, also known as bcrypt and friends. These are the examples. I will talk a little bit about them in a minute. But these are designed specifically for passwords. Uh, what they're all about. So, slow hashing algorithms. Uh, first and foremost, they're designed to slow the attacker down. So we have a situation where we already lost our password hashes database. And what the attacker is, has to do to get the passwords is basically uh, run the algorithms and check the outputs for whether this is a password or not, right? That's cracking password database. So in their design, they're slow for the purpose that if, you, if we lose the database, then it will take a long, long time for the attacker to get the passwords from it. So we are basically buying ourselves more time to inform our customers to change passwords because we, we've already lost them, right? But it's, it's a longer time uh, to, uh, to get the passwords. So n another thing is, how many of you are familiar with the SALT concept in passwords, right? Oh, cool, oh, cool, thanks. So, Salt is basically some random string that you add to the password uh, because uh, there's some some th there's a thing called a uh, rainbow table like attack. So basically, a hacker can an attacker can uh, have this uh, pre-computed hashes database of known passwords, uh, and if we don't, didn't use salt, if we didn't add anything random to every single password before hashing it, he could only just compare the strings, the resulting strings, the resulting hashes, and that's a very quick, and he already has uh, the passwords, right? So we're adding a random string to every single, uh, every single uh, password, and that, that way we're protected better. But we already could do that with MD5 and SHA-1, we just had to remember to add it, right? But the slow hashing algorithms had, have the concept of salt built inside, so you have to provide salt to compute a hash. 
And the other thing is you need to reasonably configure the slowness of the algorithms because this is the aspect that we can control. We can check whether, how long it does it take for a slow hashing algorithm to compute and, and choose the desired value. And it's, uh, and it's up to us. And you, you have to balance two things here because customer will log into your website or system or whatever, and it will take the time that is needed to compute the hash, right? So you need to balance to be secure enough, but still user experience needs, needs to be good, right? So these are the three basics. Uh, does anyone know who these guys are? I wouldn't really expect that. The, these are new kids on the block, uh, the first ever boys band. I don't want you to remember that from this talk, but uh, these guys, the, the Argon2, the first algorithm, is actually a new kid on the block because uh, in 2013, they held something called uh, password hashing competition where new cryptographic functions, algorithms, could, like you can submit, the, you could submit those. And then 2015, they said that Argon2 is actually uh, the winner, and that's the mostly, like that's the first choice that you should, that you have with the slow hashing algorithm, the, be the considered the best, but all of these are good enough. So this is the uh, new kid on the block. Uh, the other algorithm is, uh, well, they did a great job with uh, naming it uh, for you to remember, right? Easy to remember, you just pronounce it like poof, two, and that's just, you know. Um, actually, that's an acronym because we're in IT. So this is password-based key derivation function two, because one was not good enough. And uh, this is a good choice for all of you that mm, need some kind of certification in, your prod in the algorithms you use, and you still uh, want to keep the job. So. Uh, uh, the PBKDF2 actually has something like, uh, it's called FIPS certification. It's a federal information processing standard. Uh, and it's, it's the US uh, federal standard. So if you need something like this, this is, this is a good choice. Uh, it is configured by the number of iterations. It is configured by the underlying algorithm. It, um, it kind of works like you provide a, you, you of course provide a string and it uh, computes a hash. So it computes a hash over and over again. So it compu c computes a hash once and again from the hash, another hash and, and so on and so on. That's where you get the slowness. You just uh, provide the number of iterations. Another one is Scrypt, and this is um, interesting one because all the others basically uh, work on core, basically work on CPU, so processing unit, so a processor. And this one has an option to be uh, to use memory for computation. So uh, they, the creators of Escript once uh, thought that, well, okay, so CPUs are rather, uh, rather cheap now, rather easy to acquire. So maybe we'll choose any th something else that is actually more expensive. They they chose memory. So this is this has this option of using memory to compute. So very very neat if you need that, if you want that, right? Um, and the, the last one, but not the least, actually all of these are good, is Bcrypt. And Bcrypt is um, specific from this uh, point of view that it uses Blowfish cipher underneath, so the algorithm that is doing the hashing is actually Blowfish, and it's configured by the power of two. So if you pass, uh, it's, it's called a cost factor, and if you pass cost factor of, let's say, five, it will do 32 iterations of of, of Blowfish, and if, if you pass six, it's 64, right? So you get the idea. And that's, that's how you uh, configure that. Okay, so these are the examples. Let's take a little a deep, deeper dive into what Bcrypt provides. This has a random Okado string uh, with Bcrypt, and we get something like this. This is not actually a pure representation of a Bcrypt hash, it's an open BSD. Uh, hash type, and it's, uh, it has some elements into it. It's not only a resulting hash. So first one is a version. Uh, the number two actually means that's bcrypt. Number one is reserved for MD5. A means version of bcrypt. You have also got X and Y. For all of you that are interested in that, good news, there's internet, internet so I won't uh, waste time for that. But the other element is, is the number. This is the cost factor that I told you about uh, a moment ago. So this basically 
tells the algorithm that you, you should do like two to the power of eight iterations of Blowfish. Okay, uh, the, uh, the, the next element, it's 22 characters, and this is salt. This is encoded in Radix 64 for ease. Uh, it's a, slight, a slightly modified base 64, actually. And then 31 characters. This is the resulting hash. So it, it has a bit more than just a hash. It has a lot of more information. It's just convenient. All right. Um, now I would like to, uh, to show you a little bit of live demo, live code. We've got everything we need. We've got laptop, we've got a piano, so let's go. Okay, this is a simple code. Uh, we have product placement here. Yeah, right. So we'll hash a password uh, that's JDD2018, and we'll do four different algorithms. Actually, it's two algorithms, but one, first one is MD5, second one is bcrypt to the power of 2 to the power of 8, 2 to the power of 10, and 2 to the power of 12. And we will compare the average hashes per second for every single one of these. We'll do 10 attempts of every computation. Okay, so let's run this. I hope you can see that. Okay, so first thing, uh, MD5 hash is always the same, and bcrypt hash is different every time, even though we're hashing the same passwords. Can anyone tell me why? Yeah, the salt is random. The salt, uh, thanks, that's a good answer. The salt is every, every, every little, uh, single time it's random. So what's, uh, what's, n what's interesting also is that on my computer, you can compute 1,730 MD5 hashes per second, while with bcrypt to the power, with the power of eight, uh, 45 in second, then 14, then three. So you can see, like in practice, um, how much time does it really consume and why this is called a slow hashing algorithm, right? Um, you can also check this, check, check this code out on GitHub, but who would, right? Uh, okay, another thing. How long does it take to compute a hash? Different approach. I found this interesting article in the internet. Um, this guy, it's a fairly a new, fairly current article this year. Uh, this guy built a, what he called actually a budget $5,000 cracking rig. Uh, uh, well, budget, you know, that's not really my budget, but uh, he called it budget. He used four GPUs just to, you know, test how fast would it take for cracking, you know, did, did some tests. And he used Hashcat, which is a benchmark. Results. That's very interesting because it, it turns out that you can compute with this one 19 billion hashes per second per GPU. So multiply it by four, that's the actual result that he did, re, did, did uh, have with this cracking rig. That's really a lot. Consider that uh, if you are a professional villain and you are cracking passwords, then you can invest $5,000, right, and have this very efficient thing. And if you get a password uh, database, which is MD5, then, you know, it doesn't take that, that long. Uh, Show one is a little bit better, but it's still it's like only three times less, so it's, you know, very, very fast to compute. Well, compared to bcrypt, bcrypt to the, with a cost factor of five, well, it's only, like, not really 11,000, but what I wanted to say here is that five is, isn't actually uh, the cost factor that I would, re would, would recommend nowadays. It's much, much uh, bigger, so I will talk a little bit about it uh, later, but still, even if we use bcrypt with such a low cost factor, we're that secure, you know, better. So it's, it's slower, it still doesn't take that much time for us to compute it on our machines. So we're good. And actually, the companies that I was talking about, so LinkedIn, Dropbox, and uh, MySpace, they actually used SHA-1. 
And that's interesting because Bcrypt is around since 1999. So the breaches happened in 2012, so you can do the math. All right, that's from, for the theoretical part. So what did we actually do in our application? Um, firstly, a little bit about what we actually have. Uh, I was working in a project that delivered online supermarket for customers, which we're, we're actually here. So this is a website that has hundreds of thousands of customers, and we have their passwords, right? Okay, so this is what we're dealing with. And what did we have before the migration? Our application used Bcrypt with a cost factor of eight, which compared to what I already said, seems good enough, right? But uh, I will tell uh, a little bit more in a minute, but uh, still about what we had. Some old customers still had MD5, but their passwords were already migrated. So for these users, when they log in, we firstly did an MD5 of their password and then bcrypted. So basically they were secure with bcrypt as well. Uh, so they, you are as secure as you're like the strongest algorithm there, right? So this bcrypt. And actually how it looked into our database was like, we have a customer number, we had a password hash, we had a password hash type. So when this customer comes, we check uh, his or her customer number, and we check the password hash type. If it tells MD5, it says MD5, then we firstly MD5 the password, and then bcrypt it, and then just compare it with the password hash in the database. For password hash type of bcrypt, the situation is a little bit simpler. Only bcrypt the password and just compare the hash, right? And this is the format that you already told you about, 2A, 08, and so on. Okay, so this is the before state. So why did you decide to change? Um, because it seems that everything was all right. Basically, uh, we have an information security team, and they're looking after our security, our security as a company, our application security as well. And they asked us about what do you use and whether this should need updating or whatever. So we dig in. And we found out that Bcrypt, the, with a cost factor of eight, took 80 milliseconds to compute on our machines. That's pretty fast. And we did some tests, and it turned out that, well, we could easily go with 12. It takes not even a half a second, which shouldn't be uh, something that user uh, like feels, right? that shouldn't uh, have a neg negative impact on the UX, but still, we would have, uh, and, and, and we would have a stronger hash. That, that sounded cool. Okay, so we decided maybe just increase the bcrypt uh, cost factor and we're done. But uh, th th that was a time where uh, a newly, new, new team, application security was created in our company. So we decided, hey, these guys seem like good guys to ask the question. So we asked them, like, they, we presented the situation that we had, and we asked them for recommendation, whether they have any recommendation what we should use, maybe some tool that we could use. And they came up with an idea that they will provide us uh, an API and a library that we could use uh, and let them take care about the, strong, the strength of the hashes, the configuration of the algorithms, while they are the, the best people to do it. And we, only, we, we could only treat it as black box, and you know, just we have this API, and it's cool. So all right. So they, uh, they, decided, they provided us with the uh, thing called password hasher, and that will take care of password hashing. And it uses a well-known implementations of uh, cryptography underneath, uh, like Bouncy Castle, for example, you shouldn't ever implement own crypto. Just don't do it. Use uh, good implementations that are available. And it produces something called a hash vector, which I will talk about a little in a minute, that acts as a password hash. And once we migrate to this library, we are controlled by the application security since, right? Because uh, we only bump up the version of the library, and we already have better hashes 
better configuration. So that's just pure profit. It sounded cool. And I would like to introduce to you what is the format of the hash vector, what is, what is it all about. It's not only that it acts like a hash, it also has all the, like, the road, the steps that you need to compute it. So for our situation, it was, it was perfect. Why? Because it has a lot of elements. Let me go through them step by step. So the first element, MD5 hasher tells the password hasher that uh, it should use MD5 to compute. F the, the input string comes, and OK, let's MD5 it. Next element is separator, and next element is salt that it should use, encoded in base64. And all right, so we have the resulting hash. What, what next? There's a separator of algorithms. Next algorithm, it should be bcrypt. All right. And the, the next part is all, what you already know, is the bcrypt hash uh, up to the salt. So we have all, all, everything that we need to compute a bcrypt hash. Then the separator of algorithms. And this is the choice that application security made, that we will use the pbkdf2 as the main algorithm. So this is the last algorithm that we will use. It's configured with SHA-256 underneath. It's configured with the two, uh, 250,000 itera iterations underneath. And this is the salt that you should use, right? That's the, separation, the separator. And that's the last element. And that's the resulting hash, actually. So we have all the road that is needed to be you know, does need to go, and we have the resulting hash. So we have hash, have hash itself, but it also explains what to do to get it as a neat thing. And all right, what else? What else here? Not only the hash vector itself, but the API is actually pretty useful. We have three, ma three methods. We have hash, verify, and migrate. All right, so the first one. That's the basic functionality of password hasher that you need, right? You just provide a password, you just have the resulting uh, hash vector. And the resulting hash vector has only the pbkdf2 because this is the, the algorithm of choice by AppSec, the, the most secure algorithm that, uh, that it's using. That's fine. We have a hashed password. That's good for new customers, right? So another thing is interesting method called verify. You provide a password and you provide a hash vector to it. So this is a situation where a customer logs in. Customer logs in and uh, we, know their, we know what they're inputted. So the password is uh, in our hands. We also have the hash vector from the database. And we have this verification result, which is an interesting thing with interface, it's an object that has two, uh, two things inside. Its success is pretty obvious. If the, if the password is correct, then we will have true here. Uh, of course, if, if it's not, it's false. And if the password is correct, then the get hash vector could return something that is not null. If it does, that means that we have more current hash vector that we can replace for this customer. So if we have this long, long hash vector that I already shown you, like firstly MD5, then bcrypt, then pbkdf2, we don't really need it because the pbkdf2 is already secure enough and good enough and strong enough, so we can replace it. And this already provides us with this one, not need to compute it again. So a very neat situation. Of course, if the uh, is success is returning false, then we have a uh, null hash vector always. And the last method is migrate. And it's very useful for a situation when you would like to asynchronously migrate existing hashes in your database. Because uh, this is something that we also did. And if you provide uh, a hash vector that doesn't have this last best um, element, the password hasher is returning it here. So for the migration, for increasing strength of your hashes, that's a very nice method. So this is the API that we had. OK, so we needed to get a plan because uh, we're thinking humans. So we conducted the plan. Two basic things. Firstly, we would migrate passwords when customer logs in. That's pretty obvious because that uh, in that moment, we have their password. We know that it is correct or not. If it's correct, we can migrate it to the stronger hash, right? But also, we need to 
uh, we can migrate and we should migrate when a customer creates a when a customer creates or changes a password same situation already the best password uh, already has the, the best uh, hash vector that we that we can do and also not every customer is logging in every day every hour every minute so we need to do the some some work underneath in the background so firstly we would translate the existing caches to the form of hash vector for the password hasher to understand them. It's called translation. We call it that. And then we would upgrade the hash vector using the migrate method that I've just shown to have the newest algorithm as the last element. And that way we will be secure with PBKDF2 with, with whatever it is uh, configured by AppSec. And then, very important stuff, cleanup. Because if we would stay with whatever we had, like old passwords and new passwords, we're as secure as our weakest point, right? So we would still have the old ones. Why, why do the process anyways, right? Okay, so first one, migrating when customer provides uh, password. Simple thing, customer provides password, we are computing the old hash time, we only have it, the, the old one. We check uh, whether the hashes match, if they don't, it's easy stuff, right? Just provide an error to the user. But if they do, we need to compute the hash vector, the new, new hash vector, and store it in the database. And on the event that this is a password change or creation, we need to also store and modify the old hash. Why? Because we're in the transition phase. We, all, we need to have the possibility of a backout and for the backout, we also need old hashes, old way to compute hashes for the previous version of application to work correctly, right? So this is a very important part. Okay, so first thing that we are doing asynchronously is translation, as I told you. So uh, we added two columns to our database of passwords, and these are hash vector and migration status. So for the uh, existing passwords, it was uh, initially null, hash vector because we don't have it right, and non-migration status. And what translation job, translation background job did, was pick up all these nuns, not priests, nuns, uh, and translate them. For the MD5, this is a simple, actually all the translation is simple operation on strings because we have the salts, we need to have the salts. We don't have the resulting hash, but it's only uh, changing the uh, the way we are presenting it from the uh, raw bcrypt hash to a hash vector, right? So we are just, you know, just a simple translation. For MD5, it starts with MD5 hasher than bcrypt. For bcrypt, simpler, only bcrypt hasher. And we have something that password hasher understands. That's the first step. The second step is upgrade. So it takes all the translated, already translated passwords to hash vectors and runs it through the migrate method of password hasher. So it adds this PBKDF2 most secure uh, algorithm to the end. And we have the stronger hash here. For MD5, it's three elements. For bcrypt, it's only two because, because that's how it is. And we have an upgraded uh, passwords. So this is cool. And after full migration is done, very important thing that I already mentioned, a cleanup. So basically after we are sure that everything works, everything's fine, password hasher works, we're just basically dropping the data that is less secure. And I'll play it once again because it took a long, long time to prepare this slide. Right, cool. Uh, a thing that we developed also along the way was uh, an, a simple endpoint that returned this uh, fantastic HTML piece of work. And uh, during the migration, when we run the uh, background jobs underneath, we, uh, from time to time, actually every day in the morning, we just generated this report, and s we wanted to see uh, where are we, right? Where are we with the, with the migration? Uh, the failure count is a field that we added. If we, we would increment the counter every time anything wrong happens, like, if, like like, like a connection with the database is lost or, or any exception code uh, goes, uh, anything goes wrong, we will increase in the failure count. And in the report, it would say, we, we should just look into the application logs for any other details, right? Something went wrong. Okay, so we got 
all of this, we've conducted it. And it wouldn't be a complete case study without uh, being clear about problems that we had, and we had problems, of course. Um, first thing, time taken to migrate. So, we've computed how much would it take to translate password hashes, how much would it take to upgrade them, and it turned out that a single node of our application would need to uh, spend 30 days straight to migrate these. And it sounded a little bit too much, but we thought, what can we do about it? Well, we cannot really uh, speed up the process, but we don't want any negative effect for the users, like, some, like the applications will, will do some background job, and maybe it will negatively affect the performance. Neg negatively affect the time. So we decided that we will create an additional node of the application, do the, all the work there, and it will be not connected to the load balancer. So it will not uh, serve the traffic for the customers, it will just be in the background, and after the job is done, we will actually use the new node as a new application node and a simple just profit. So, so it would, uh, that, that, that was our decision, that, uh, how we tackled the problem. Another problem. Uh, in the process of migration, it turned out that we had problems with orphan password entries. So basically, we had passwords that didn't have owners. Uh, it looked pretty embarrassing, but why did it happen? So we have this tool that is uh, querying production from time to time, actually every minute or so, which is checking whether registration login is, is working correctly. So uh, this tool has a process of cleaning up. And the process of cleaning up was missing one code line, which was delete password. So we had a lot of orphans there, and we needed to do something about it, because it what, didn't sound quite right to migrate cust like customer passwords, which are of non-customers, right? But we also live uh, in an in a enterprise world. So we thought it was orphans, but we needed to be prepared for a situation where something, I don't know why, but needs it. So uh, we thought, okay, we need, a, we need a backup for this. If we need, we're about to delete any passwords, we need a backup. So I contacted the DBAs to ask, what are the, you know, how does the backup work? Of course, we have backups. But it turns out that it's really resource consuming, time consuming. And we cannot really uh, accept this. Uh, you know, if, if a customer like cannot log in at some point, we need to act fast. So we decided to do the backup on our end. Uh, just create another table, which was a clone of the old table, and just just move all the orphan passwords there, keep it for some time, and lose it when we are sure that we won't need it. That's why. That's how we tackled it. <sighs> another problem. Entire process took over a year. And this is, this is a long time, I know. And why did it, why did it happen? Uh, it wasn't the highest priority task that we had. A lot of things happened in between. Uh, you know, we were driven by like uh, more important business stuff. So we got back to the to the uh, to the task once in a, once in a while, and that's how it. And also, you know, the year consists of all these talking with uh, application security, talking with information security, uh, research, and uh, planning, and testing, and a lot of that. So this is a year, but you know, things uh, just take time. And also, at some point, we had the problem with application performance. And uh, guys that were investigating it, the guys from support contacted us and said, hey, we, have, we see that this process is going on in the database, and we have performance problems, can you please pause the process? Because we're not sure whether it's causing problems or not. And we did. We, we, wa we weren't the guys that were causing the problems, actually, but that also affected how long did it take to migrate. All right. I'm almost done. So, summary. Uh, thanks to, I think, you, I would like you to remember so just use slow hashing algorithms for passwords. Just they are already there. They are exactly the thing that you need. Just need to 
uh, reasonably configure them, monitor the process, and just monitor the time that's, ta that's taken to compute the hash, and you're good. Everything's there. Also, uh, if you have the possibility, I would encourage you to migrate the hashes if you need it. Uh, this is a possible process, complicated but not impossible. Very, very important is to prepare wisely. Very, very important is to clean up afterwards, and very important is also to monitor. A uh, couple of links, uh, especially interesting, the last one, when you, that's a legit site. You can check whether your email or password have been compromised in any of the breaches. The LinkedIn, Dropbox, MySpace stuff is already there as well. So an interesting thing. Uh, I will be very grateful for feedback in the Inventory app. Uh, thanks for that. That will help me grow and uh, deliver best talk, b better talks. And um, that's it. Thanks. Do you have any questions? Thank you. <laughs>